You see, this word pressing in the Bible, it's a action verb. It's a word that refers to reaching out and struggling. It's a fighting word, guys. And what this verse is challenging you to do, what you see on the screens, what you're wearing on your shirt, it's challenging you to fight for your faith especially in this wicked, sin-sick world that we live in. It's going to be a fight from the moment that you wake up until you fall in the bed exhausted at night. You never get a chance to let your guard down in this world that we live in. If you're going to press forward, guys, there's a challenge that you're going to have to deal with. And I'm here today to just challenge you about this. So let me give you a little bit about my background because I am the most unlikely guy in the room, quite literally the most unlikely guy to be here having this conversation with you. You heard a little bit about my military background. Man, I I served most of my adult life in the United States Army. I still live close to this military base because I love warriors, love being around warriors. I want to hang out with those guys and gals for the rest of my life. But I joined the Army at 18, out of a whim. It actually never crossed my mind. See, I don't come from a military family, so I never really even considered joining the Army until my high school buddy, senior year, just about ready to graduate, my buddy Tony in high school joined the Army and then came to school the next day and said, Jeff, I just joined the Army, and you should too, because it'll be cool. Tony didn't bother to tell me that the Army was offering him extra money if he could convince his idiot friends from high school to sign up. And I showed up to the Army recruiter's office with no plans and no uh, expectations. In fact, I wasn't even really sure I was going to do this. But I showed up that day, middle of the afternoon. I'm the only guy in the room, two active duty Army recruiters, And I asked a question that changed my life forever. I asked this guy that I was talking to, this Army recruiter, what's the toughest job in the Army? And then an argument broke out in the room. There's a recruiter on the opposite side of the room who yells across the room because he overheard the conversation. He yells, it's the Army's Green Berets. Those are the toughest people in the military. But this recruiter that I'm talking to says, no, Jeff, it's the Army Rangers. Those guys, hands down, are the toughest. I don't know the difference between Green Berets and Army Rangers. So I asked this guy, like, what's the difference? And he said, well, let me explain it to you this way. Let's say that we were to take a Special Forces Alpha team, about 12 guys, put them at the bottom of the Gateway Arch in St. Louis, and tell them to go to the top of the arch. And at the exact same time, we take a Ranger squad, about 10 guys, put them at the bottom of the arch, and tell both groups to get to the top of the arch. Jeff, let me tell you about Army Rangers. They're going to do in St. Louis what they did on D-Day. Those rangers are going to take grappling hooks and knotted hand lines and they'll throw it over the top of the arch and they'll climb up those cliffs or climb up that arch with a knife in their teeth just like they did the cliffs on June 6, 1944 in Normandy, France. That's Army Rangers. But if you want to be special forces, those dudes are just going to run inside because you know there's an elevator in there. They'll just hit the top floor in the elevator button and they'll go take the elevator to the top. And then this recruiter, no exaggeration, he looked me in the eyes and he said, listen, kid, you have no idea what you're asking for. And before you go any farther down this road, I want you to go home and watch this documentary. This is an army propaganda. This is a news show about ranger training. You go home and watch this, and then you come back and talk to me. And in five minutes of watching this documentary, I was hooked. Because what I watched is some of the toughest, strongest, smartest people in the military try ranger training. They actually come from all over the world to my hometown, and they attempt ranger training. And 60, 70, 80 percent of them don't make it through the first week, let alone several months of the ranger course. And I took this documentary back, and I handed it to this recruiter. And I said, sign me up. I want to become an Army Ranger. 
but I didn't tell him why. Because I was worried that if he knew why I wanted to be an Army Ranger, they wouldn't even let me in the military. You see, the real reason I wanted to do this is because I wanted to go to war, I wanted to get shot at, and I wanted to know if I was ready to die. No exaggeration, guys. This started for me back in elementary school. You see, I didn't grow up in a church like this. I didn't grow up in a Christian family. In fact, I was quite literally as far from Jesus as a person can be because there was no one in my life at all that talked about Jesus, that read the Bible, that prayed. No one went to church where I was growing up. And so I grew up with this absolutely overwhelming, terrifying fear of dying. And I mean from early in childhood, I would lay awake in bed at night, and I know I I'm going to die, 100% certainty, every one of us in this room are going to die, but I don't know what happens next, and it scared me. It scared me, and I would get up in the middle of the night, and I would go wake my family up, and I would ask them questions about heaven and about the afterlife, but they don't know any of those answers. And so for me, this went on year after year, and I wrestled with this fear of dying, and man, I really struggled with this, and I could find no answers anywhere until God graciously, God loved me enough that graciously my family moved to a little apartment complex right outside of Nashville, Tennessee, and right across the street, right across the hall in the same apartment building was a young married couple. They were in their early 20s. And for whatever reason, that married couple treated me like a little brother. They wanted to hang out with me. They wanted to play games with me. They, they wanted to spend time together. And after a couple of months of getting to know them, one night, late at night, they came across the hall. They knocked on my door and they said, Jeff, can we come in and sit down and talk to you? We have something really important that we want to talk to you about. They were acting weird and I thought I did something wrong. And I was kind of nervous in this conversation. And they sat down at my dining room table And this couple started to explain to me who Jesus is. And they started to tell me about sin, and they described what happened on a cross on a hillside outside of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. And then they made a statement. I will never forget it for the rest of my life. They said, Jeff, if you will surrender your life to Jesus Christ, like some of those guys did just a couple of minutes ago, if you will surrender your life to Christ, Jeff, he will radically, he will totally change you. In fact, he will do it right here, right now. It's called the abundant life. It's living by the Holy Spirit. You can read about it in John chapter 10. But they said, Jeff, not only will Jesus give you abundant life, but if you turn your soul over to him, he will give you eternal life. And you don't ever have to worry about what happens to you after you die. And that hit me like a bullet when they made that statement. In fact, later on that night, I was laying in bed. I'm 13 years old. I'm a freshman in high school. And I cannot get these words out of my head. I just can't stop thinking about it. And I got out of my bed, and I knelt down. I don't even remember the prayer, but basically I said, God, I'm sick of living in this fear, and I need you to change me. I want to become a Christian. And I laid down, and I went to sleep. And guys, when I got up the next morning, something was different. I mean radically different inside of me. It was so different that when I got off the bus from high school, instead of going to my apartment, I went next door and knocked on my neighbor's door and said, I prayed last night, and man, something is different inside of me. So I'm in this recruiter's office, and really what I'm trying to figure out is, am I really over this fear of dying? But you can't ask a recruiter to send you to war and shoot at you because they're going to think you're a little bit crazy. So I joined the Army. Immediately after leaving high school, I show up as a private in the Army 75th Ranger Regiment. This is a special operations unit. It's located across the United States, but it's headquartered in Georgia, South Georgia, where I came from today. I showed up there as a private, and I served in that unit for the next 10 years straight. In fact, I went back and forth to the unit several more times, and I served with some of the greatest warriors this country has ever known. 
I'm in the army for a couple of years. It's 1989. We're about to invade the Republic of Panama. I'm a sergeant in the Ranger Regiment. And literally the day before we're supposed to sign out on Christmas vacation and everybody's going to go all over the country, the pager goes off. Does anybody in this room remember pagers? This pager has a secret code, and the secret code means stop what you're doing, drop everything, go back to work. And when I show back up, it says, you're not going home. You're going to load airplanes, and you're going down to Panama, and we're going to invade the country. December 20th, 1989, my unit, the Ranger Regiment, conducts parachute assaults onto two airfields. We seize those airfields, the rest of the invasion force flies in, and then we spread out from there and start to take down the country. On the first night of the invasion, we put 140 aircraft in the skies. And we knew there was a high chance that some of them were gonna get shot down. We needed a search and rescue force. So I flew down to Panama 24 hours before the invasion began and provided the search and rescue force for the whole operation. After that first parachute assault, the next phase of the operation was take down the Panamanian military. But the real reason this special operations force was down there, the mission inside the mission was to go ca capture the country's leader, Manuel Noriega. We started taking the, the military down a couple of weeks into this thing. We've defeated the military. We've captured Noriega. And I'm on my way back to Georgia uh, two weeks into my first uh, combat experience. Now I got in a couple of firefights in Panama. But those firefights, although they were, they were really pretty intense and a lot of adrenaline, they were never one of those life or death circumstances that I joined the army to, to settle. So when I came back from Panama, there was still a couple of things about the military that I hadn't settled in my heart. But some of my buddies who were 19 years old, while they were still parachuting down to the ground, they were under enemy fire. A couple of those guys were killed while they were still in their parachutes. They never got a chance to put their weapon into action. And it was a wake-up call for me. You see, most people that I know, this may be you, we live our lives like we're going to be around forever. But this was a wake-up call that none of us in this room, not me, not you, not anybody, none of us are guaranteed that we're going to be around tomorrow. And Panama shook me and woke me up and reminded me, if there's some stuff that's undone, if you're sitting on some things that are important to you and you're just waiting to take care of those later, don't wait because later may never come. And for me, the thing that I was dragging my feet on is asking my high school sweetheart to marry me. So the first chance that I got, I went out, bought a ring, and flew home and proposed. My wife and I set a date to get married about a year later. Now, a year after Panama, if you know your history, you know that the United States is involved in operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. I'm in Georgia. My fiance is halfway across the country. We're just a couple of weeks away from our wedding day which means we've pretty much taken care of all of the details. Well, you know the deal, guys. She's done all of the details. I'm just getting ready for the wedding because I'm really looking forward to the wedding night. And then I get notified. Now, I'm in a special operations unit, which means everything that we do is secret. And I'm just about at my wedding day, and I get notified that we're going to deploy. So I convince my commander, would you let me go across the, the uh, hall and make a phone call from a unsecure payphone? Does anybody, has anybody ever seen a payphone in this room? I call back home, and the conversation goes like this. Don, I can't tell you where I'm going. And I'm not authorized to tell you when I'm leaving, and I don't know when I'm going to get back, but I'm pretty sure I'm not going to be in the country on our wedding day. And there's a long pause on the phone. And she says, Jeff, if you're going to war again, we need to get married before you leave. We need to get married right away. And I said, well, first of all, this isn't a secure phone line. And secondly, I never actually used the word war. I'm just saying I'm probably not going to be around on our wedding day. 
And this is how patriotic my wife is. I remember her response. It shocked me when I heard her say, Jeff, don't play games with me. If you get killed, I want the flag. We need to get married before you go off to war. That's how patriotic my wife is. And I ran back and uh, talked to my commander who said, yes, I flew home and landed at noon in our hometown. I got married that afternoon, got back on a plane and went off to Kuwait and got in a firefight in Kuwait. But it was nothing like I experienced in Somalia. Now, if you've seen the movie or read the book Black Hawk Down, my role in that fight is pretty limited. When you see the actor who plays me in the movie, it's generally when you'll see the vehicles on the ground. I'm trying to tell you that by the time I go to Somalia, I'm 24 years old. I'm a ranger squad leader. I've got 10 men that I'm responsible for, and our mission is on the vehicles. But this is not my first rodeo. In fact, I've been around blood and I've been around bullets before this fight, but never like what I saw in Somalia. It was unlike any war that I've seen before or since. We get sent over to Somalia. Actually, we're doing some training, this big, giant training exercise, and we're training from something else in the world. And then in the summer of 1993, the conditions in Somalia are deteriorating. The U.S. showed up to this country in December of 92 to help a country, actually not the country, but the whole part of Africa that was dying of starvation by the hundreds of thousands. And I'm trying to tell you, we're not the kind of country that goes there because we want your oil or we want some uh, to control your country. We're just there to hand out a bag of beans and a bag of rice and try to keep you alive for another day. That's why the Marines landed on the beaches in 1992. By the summer of 93, the situation is deteriorating. In the capital city of Mogadishu, there's no government, no military, no police force, which means evil men can do whatever they want to do, and they were doing it. And the United Nations, the United States are over there trying to help a starving country. And in the summer of 93, one of the rebel warlords, he's like a gang leader in our country. They use drugs, they use guns, and they do whatever they want to do. This warlord by the name of Muhammad Farah Idid started to target United States supply convoys, started to blow them up with roadside bombs. And then he started to attack food distribution sites. I'm training for a big mission somewhere else in the world. In June of 93, Muhammad Farah Idid and his Haber Getter clan ambush and uh, murder all of the United Nations workers at a food distribution site. And that night, the UN Security Council met. And they all said, we got to do something about this guy, and we got to do something about Somalia. So the U.S. sent this very small, highly surgical force over to Somalia on a killer capture mission. I'm not there to hand out food. I'm there to do bad things to bad people because they deserve it. And this very small force of one company from the Ranger Regiment, a uh, helicopter unit from Kentucky, and some special operations forces, all branches of the military, we all came together and we go over to Somalia on this killer capture mission. We're a couple of months into the fight. We thought it was actually only going to take a few weeks, and now we're a couple of months into it, and we still don't have the number one bad guy. We've taken down a lot of people in his organization, but we don't have number one on the list and a couple of uh, high-ranking leaders. And we're getting a lot of pressure from President Clinton to wrap this thing up and to get out of Somalia because the news is starting to call it another Vietnam. So we get a tip on Sunday afternoon, October 3rd, that there's two high-profile bad guys meeting in the same building at the same time. Now check this out. Rangers... Special operators never do combat missions during the daytime. 
We go overseas and we basically live like vampires. We wait for the sun to go down, we plan targets, we go out and hit targets, and then we come back before the sun ever comes up. Basically, we go out and do bad things to people and then scurry back before anybody even knows that we're there. But this is broad daylight, and this is the first time we've ever seen two high-value targets in the same building at the same time. We all know this is bad. We all know this could be very, very ugly. But my big boss, the JSOC commander, General Bill Garrison, makes the decision to launch the force to go get these guys. So special operators fly in on Little Bird helicopters and assault the target building. As they're doing that, other rangers from my unit go in on Black Hawk, Black Hawk helicopters, and they slide down ropes, and they put positions at the four corners of the target building. Their job is to keep the whole city out of that building while it's being taken down. And while all of that is going on, I lead a long column of Humvees through the city streets. We stage about a half a block away from the target building, and the plan is for us to arrive arrive about the time that the helicopters are pulling away. We'll wait for the call that the building is secure, bad guys are in our control, drive up the last half block, everybody gets on the vehicles. We plan to get in and out of there in less than 30 minutes because if we don't, the whole city will collapse in on us. But for all of the warriors in this room, you know that nothing ever goes according to plan. It's called Murphy's Law. And when those rangers were leaving the Blackhawks, when they were sliding down the ropes, one of those guys missed the rope, and he fell 70 feet, and he landed in the city streets head first. So as soon as I arrive with the vehicles, my boss, Colonel Danny McKnight, is calling me saying, Jeff, we got a seriously wounded ranger. I need you to get him on your Humvees, take him back to the base, and get him immediate medical attention. I'm already under gunfire. And I have to fight my way up to Blackburn. He, the guy who fell out of the helicopter, when I get there, he's already unconscious. He's got a couple of special operations medics working on him, trying to keep him alive. So we place him on a stretcher, and I put him on a Humvee, a cargo Humvee. It's like a pickup truck with no protection. I split my men in half, and I put half of my guys on a Humvee in front of him and the rest of my guys on a Humvee behind them, and we're gonna be the guns to provide some protection to get Blackburn back to the base. Call my boss, and I tell him, hey, I'm gonna drive Blackburn back, drop him off, I'll turn around, I'll get right back out here as fast as I can. I'm fighting my way down the road, right next to the target building, but we're driving really slowly because there's no question Blackburn has some severe head and neck injuries. And I want to make sure these vehicles avoid potholes, avoid roadside bombs, avoid the debris in the road so that we don't do further damage. And I turned onto this dirt road, one of the only major roads in Somalia. And guys, when I turned that road, the entire city erupted with gunfire on these three Humvees. I can't over-exaggerate this. It was coming from every rooftop, from every window, from every doorway, across every alleyway. There were RPGs coming across both sides of the street. They were just lobbing hand grenades at us, automatic gunfire from 10 feet away. It was so close that you couldn't miss at that distance. And I had a kid on a 50 caliber machine gun on top of my Humvee who's holding the trigger down and spraying bullets all over the place, but he wasn't being very effective that way. So I told him to take his machine gun, face the left side of the vehicle, and pick up all of the bad guys on the left. Because there's also another guy sitting right behind me in the vehicle with a machine gun. His name is Dominic Pella. And to this day, Pella is the greatest machine gunner I've ever seen in my life. So I told him to take his machine gun and face the right. I'll take the front of the vehicle. Another guy in the back will take the rear of the vehicle. And you warriors in the room know what's happening. We're just trying to keep each other alive long enough to make it back to the base. Down the road on the right side, hiding, waiting for us, was a Somali gunman. And when we get right next to him, Pilla and this gunman engage each other at the same moment. They shoot and kill each other at the same instant. The movie deliberately downplays the blood. But Pilla took a round in the forehead just above his eye. 
and he took a massive head wound. He was dead before his body hit the floorboard. And everyone in those vehicles started to panic. They were screaming my name out. Sergeant Struker, Pill has been hit. He's been killed. And when I looked over my shoulder, it was like the whole back of that Humvee just got painted red with Pilla's blood. And everyone is starting to panic. And panic sweeps through combat like cancer. So I remembered thinking to myself, Jeff, you're a leader. You're in charge here. You have to get yourself under control before you can get your men under control. So very calmly, very deliberately, I told Tim Moynihan in the back seat to take his weapon, face the right side of the Humvee, pick up Dominic Pilla's sector of fire, and kill as many bad guys as possible if we're going to have any chance at survival. We had to fight our way back to the base. And guys, when I got back there, it was chaos. Because the medics were running to my Humvee to pull Dominic Pilla's dead body off of the back. And the surgeon was running to get to Todd Blackburn to try to keep him alive. Vehicles are shot to pieces. And I was leaning over the hood of this Humvee thinking, God, I can't believe that I survived that. I can't believe that anybody just made it out of those city streets alive. And that's when my platoon leader, Lieutenant Larry Moores, walked up to me. And he said, hey, Jeff, we just had a second Blackhawk go down. I didn't even know the first one went down. I was so busy fighting for my life. He said, we've already put the search and rescue force in at the first crash site. Now we've got a second Black Hawk that went down, and we don't have anybody left. So, Jeff, I need you to get back on the Humvees. We need to drive out to Mike Durant's helicopter and see if there are any survivors. When he walked away, one of those special operators who came back with me, just like you see in the movie, he said, hey, Sergeant, if you're going out into those city streets tonight, don't leave your men sitting in the back of that Humvee and all of that blood. He said, man, that will really mess them up if you do that. So I sent all the rest of my guys, go get some more fuel, go get some more ammunition, go get ready to go back out into the city streets. And I pulled this one Humvee off to the side. Now, we didn't have running water. I didn't even have a chance to put gloves on my hands, just buckets and my bare hands splash in the back of this Humvee, and guys, without a doubt, this is the most terrifying moment of my life. There isn't even a close second. You see, I'm sitting there thinking to myself about my men, and I'm thinking, I don't know if anybody survived where those two helicopters went down, but the only guy from the entire force killed in action was sitting about 12 inches away from me when he took one in the forehead, and if I drive the rest of my men out through that kind of fight, all of us are going to be dead tomorrow morning. My first thought was for my men. My second thought was for my family. You see, my wife and I had been married for almost three years now. We had been trying to have a baby the whole time, and I got a letter in the mail saying that she was already pregnant. I just didn't even know it when I was showing up in Somalia, and now I'm thinking, I'm never going to see my wife again. And my child will never even know who their father is. And guys, I am scared to death, and I'm not at all ashamed to say it. But there's a problem. You see, these rangers that I served with, one or two of them that I had the privilege of meeting in this room today, These rangers get up and every single day they pledge their lives to one another. They do it quite literally first thing in the morning. They recite what's called the Ranger Creed. And one of the parts of that Ranger Creed says, I will never leave a fallen comrade to fall into the hands of the enemy. We are pledging our lives to one another. And I'm at the back of that Humvee, and I am scared to death. And that's when I start to think, God, if I go back out into those city streets, I know I'm going to die. If I don't go back out into those city streets, I know that the guys at that crash site are going to die. There's no way out of this thing. Tonight, a lot of people are going to die, and I know it's going to be me if I drive back out there. But I don't have a choice because I gave my word. And I'm at the back of this Humvee. 
And that's when I start to wrestle with God about my faith. That's when I start to struggle, to fight, to press with God, and to start to press forward. You see, at the back of this Humvee, the Holy Spirit starts to remind me of something. He starts to remind me, Jeff, when you were 13 years old, you said that you were trusting your life in Jesus' hands. Did you really mean that or not? Because if you really meant those words, he's got you in the palm of his hand. He's the one who will decide who lives and who dies tonight. It's not in your hands, Jeff. It's in Jesus' hands. And then the Lord just showed me something very... Look, guys, I'm a simple guy. So he just showed me something very simple. It's only one of two ways that this thing is going to go down tonight. Maybe God does a miracle. Maybe God lets me survive. Maybe I get a chance to go home to my family in the United States, but probably not. Tonight is probably the night where I take one in the chest and where I end up standing before God in heaven. But then there was a moment, and it was like a switch just got flipped inside my soul. There was a moment at the back of this Humvee where I started thinking, either I go home to my family in Georgia, or I go home to my Father in heaven. No matter what happens to me next, I cannot lose. And from that moment forward, guys. I am 100% sure, no question in my mind, I know I'm going to die, but it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter because I have the promise of eternity. I know what's waiting for me on the other side. And so what do I have to worry about? And that gave me the courage to go back out into those city streets, not once, but multiple times, I stay out there until 9 o'clock the next morning. I'm the last Humvee to make it back to the base. And when I get back to the base the next morning, my buddies are waiting for me. I didn't even get all the way off the vehicles when those big, tough Army Rangers are grabbing me and hugging me with tears in their eyes saying, Jeff, I listened to your voice over the radio last night. And everybody else was totally terrified and you sounded like you were calm. I don't even understand how that's possible because you and I have the same training. They were saying, Jeff, I watched you in the city streets and when everyone else is freaking out, you look like you're completely under control. How is that even possible? And my buddies who I have been trying to talk to about Jesus for years, who have been blowing me off and calling religion a crutch and saying, I don't need you, Jeff, and I don't need Jesus. They're walking up to me and they're saying, Jeff, you have something and I don't even know what it is, but I want that. I loved being an army ranger. I loved serving the country, and I loved Jesus, and I just thought I was going to do that for the rest of my life. And after getting off of those Humvees, there was a moment. I've never heard an audible voice from heaven, but this was as clear as anything I've ever experienced in my life. There was a moment that I just felt God telling me, Jeff, the reason why you could fight the way you did last night is because of your faith. You have something, and they don't. And I want you to start to reach America's warriors. Instead of kicking in doors, instead of getting it on with the enemies of our country, Jeff, I want you to prepare America's warriors for eternity. You've been doing a great job getting them ready for the enemy. I want you to get them ready for eternity. And that's the moment that set me on a path to become an Army chaplain. Listen to these numbers, guys. The last 10 years in the Army, I went to Afghanistan nine times and Iraq five times. I could stand among my men and say, guys, I know exactly what you're going through because I've been there too. And I'm here to tell you, you have nothing to fear when you have settled your eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing the enemy can do to you. <laughs> Guys, let me get personal with you for a second. If you're going to do this, if you're really, really going to 
press forward. If you're going to do what the great apostle Paul challenges us to do, he says there's some stuff in your past you're going to have to leave behind. There's no way you can run. There's no way you can struggle. There's no way you can fight forward if you're hanging on to a lot of junk in the past. You're going to have to leave some stuff behind. And if you really, really want to do that, you're going to have to work at it. It's going to be a fight, and you can't let your guard down until you're dying breath. So guys, I'm here to challenge you that some of you in this room need to leave something behind. In fact, all of us in this room have to leave one thing behind or you're not even on the path. Let me tell you what the Bible says to us. And this is to me too. This comes from the book of Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I want you to listen to the great apostle Paul because he was speaking my testimony and writing it in the Bible when he wrote these words. Galatians 2, 20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me and the life that I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. And he gave himself up for me. Guys, I want to challenge you about the word faith. If for you, faith is nothing but just simply believing a set of facts, intellectually believing that Jesus really is a guy who lived a long time ago on a hillside outside of Jerusalem. He died. You may even believe that he died for you and that he rose again. But if it's just a set of facts and Jesus is no more real to you than George Washington or Abraham Lincoln, you don't know what the Bible is challenging you to do with this word faith. What the Bible is saying is, no, you put it all on the line and you put it all in his hands. And if you do that, he'll show up. If you do that, he will meet you. He will change you. And he will be the one that starts to live in you and through you. And it's no longer you doing it. And what my buddies were saying to me when I got off those Humvees is, I saw something supernatural on those city streets, Jeff. That wasn't you. There was something inside of you. And whatever that thing is, I want that. And guys, the only way that you can live out Galatians 2.20 is to put yourself in the past. It's quite literally to die to self and to say, you know what? My sins, my struggles... My mistakes, my failures, none of those things matter anymore. What matters from this point forward is grabbing a hold of King Jesus and hanging on to him and running with him as hard as I can for the rest of my life. I am convinced that God brought you here. Not brought me here. He brought you here today because he wants you to let go of something. 